Welcome to Unleash Your Genius, Better Dissertations and Doctoral Projects in Less Time with Less Stress. My name is Heather Frederick, and I've been working in doctoral programs for a little over 20 years now, teaching courses, mentoring student research, and training faculty. And I am so excited to be with you today to talk to you about the important role of self care when you're on this journey. Now, I'd love to know. If you have a regular self-care practice, so let me get the poll up for you. Would you say, yes, you have one? No, you don't have one or hmm, kind of, sort of, maybe, not so sure how I want to answer that. And this just helps me know who is on the call. But I promise you, no matter how you answer, I have something on today's talk for you today. I'm going to end the poll here. It looks like we have about a 50-50 split, which is great because honestly, usually when I'm talking to a group of very busy people, it's more than half who say they don't. So kudos to you guys. Okay, let's give a brief overview of what's going to happen on this talk. So by the end, you will understand the importance of self-care during your doctoral journey. We're going to identify barriers as to why you may not have a regular practice or why sometimes it's hard to maintain it. You're going to learn the three things you need to know to really create a sustainable practice. And today, before we get off the call, if you don't already have one that's working really well for you, you're going to pick something. And this is my favorite part. Collectively, we are going to engage in two self-care exercises so you can see some benefits right away. All right, head over to your chat box and let me know when you hear the word dissertation or doctoral project, whichever it is for you in your program, some of you are writing dissertations, some doctoral projects, how do you feel or what word or words come to mind? I would love for you to share what happens for you when you hear dissertation or doctoral project. Anxious, scared, stressed, overwhelmed, anxious. Yes, super common responses because, <laughs> Beth, yikes, that's a good one. Creating this capstone project, whatever it is for you, a dissertation or doc project can be stressful. Now, this is what we know from the research. We know that 50% of people who start a doctoral program don't finish. Now that's combined across discipline. So it does vary from discipline to discipline, but that's a heck of a lot of people who start and don't finish. And here's the part that breaks my heart. The majority of those people who are dropping out are dropping out at the end when they're working on this capstone research. Why? Because yes, it can be stressful. And we know stress impacts our body. We know it impacts our mind. Both are really important on this journey, but I want to give you an example of why it's so important to be able to manage this when it comes to cognitive function. So I want you to play along with me and think back to a time where you acted in a way that just wasn't you. Maybe you said something you wish you hadn't said, or maybe you acted in haste. And if I were to ask you, when you think about that event, is there any chance you were stressed out? And nine times out of 10, people will say yes. And the reason is because stress cuts off access to the part of your brain that you need to think clearly. You may have even heard the phrase, stress makes you stupid. But you're in a situation where you need to be the opposite of that, right? And self-care basically makes you smart. Now, I can sit here all day long and try to provide more and more evidence to convince you of this if you're not already convinced. But what I would rather do is give you an opportunity to experience this. Now, if you're not familiar with the humming breath, it is one of my favorite activities. And if you can participate, it will mean you're going to be making some noise. So I get it if you're in a place where you can't make noise, I will have resources for you at the end where you could go through this exercise if there's a better time or place for you. Uh, super simple. You can't get it wrong. There's no way to mess this up. It's going to be an inhale. And then when you exhale, 
just like it sounds. All right. And we'll do three breaths. You don't need to worry about matching my cycle, whatever works for you, whatever's comfortable. So if you're in a situation where you can get a little more comfortable, I'm going to invite you to do that. Maybe uncross your legs if they're crossed and find your feet firmly planted on the ground. Maybe roll those shoulders up, back and down. And if it's safe for you to do so, blink your eyes shut. And then take just a moment to relax the skin on your forehead. So it feels just like the skin around your eyes. And then we're going to take a nice deep breath in and then hum it out. Another nice deep breath, filling up your belly, your sides, and your back. And then letting it go through a hum. And now the biggest breath you've taken all day. And then let it out. And rest for just a moment in this vibration. And let me ask you, what feeling would you like to have more of when you think about your doctoral journey? What feeling? Maybe the word that comes for you is confidence or peace or clarity. Whatever word you get, take just a moment to breathe that in, recognizing how your body feels when you have more of that. One more deep breath in. Let that go. And let's introduce some movement back into the body, maybe rolling your wrist or flicking your fingers. Everyone, you're ready, blinking your eyes open. Some of you got a head start and shared in the chat box the word that came to you. I see calm, confidence. And what you did, if you were able to play around with me, was experience in just a few minutes how effective an exercise like that, and that's a ventral vagal toning exercise, and without getting into the science behind it, which, by the way, there's a lot of, you just reset your nervous system. You just gave yourself access to the part of the brain that you need access to in order to have the stamina, the brain power, and the emotional aptitude you need to complete the task at hand. So. You're going to have that clear mind and self-care practices promote a healthy body and harmonious relationships. And guys, this is no small thing. Think about it. If you're not sick, if you're not chronically tired, if you're not trying to resolve conflict at home or at work, guess what that means? That means you have more time to dedicate to your doctoral studies, but probably Really, the most important thing that I see a self-care practice doing for doctoral students, especially when they're near the end of the program, is that it gives you the ability to respond rather than react. Now, I know you're all in different stages. And if you haven't gotten to the stage where you're getting a lot of substantial, constructive, critical feedback, it's coming. And that feedback, think of it as a stimulus. And we usually get triggered. We respond in ways ranging from feeling sad, frustrated, confused. But these are stressful feelings. And these are feelings that you're going to have to mitigate if you want to unleash your genius so that you can respond to the feedback and get done. Listen, the name of the game here, if you want to 
better dissertation and less time with less stress is to reduce the absolute number of revision cycles that you're going to go through. You've got three people who are on your, your team or on your committee who are giving you their feedback that you need to integrate into this capstone product that proves to the university you've met the standards that are equivalent of a doctoral degree. One of my favorite quotes is by Viktor Frankl, and he said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. So in a sense, a self-care practice can be your superpower because it will allow you to tap into the space so that you can respond to that feedback in a way that grows your project. And by the way, you're not just going to be growing academically and professionally, but also personally through this journey, if you haven't already experienced that. So you might be wondering, is Heather saying, I have to have a self-care practice? And the answer is no. For the 50-ish percent of you that said you don't have one or you only kind of sort of do, you're all successful without one. And I lived the majority of my life without one. But I will argue that if you want to experience an enjoyable journey, keep your sanity, your health, and your relationships intact, and unleash your genius, which is what you need for the task at hand, then I would say self-care is non-negotiable. Now, I've been tossing around this word self-care and haven't even defined it for you yet. If you do a Google search, you're going to come up with something like, it's things you do to take care of yourself, especially when you're stressed. And if we all agree this is a pretty good idea, given that we live in human bodies for a relatively short period of time, then it begs the question, why don't we do more? Why aren't we all self-care gurus? And if you want to share some of your reasons in the chat box, feel free to do so. But the top ones are here. Ability resources, eh, I don't think they're fun. But the number one reason given is time. And I see that in the chat box. But I have some good news for you. Are you ready? A self-care practice expands time. Okay, I know this sounds counterintuitive, because I'm saying, hey, add something to your already busy schedule. But the truth is, a self-care practice gives you this feeling of having more time. You may have heard the quote, if you're too busy to sit in meditation today for 20 minutes, then sit for an hour. And the reason is that when you have access to that part of your brain that allows you to be a rational decision maker, you can decide when to do what, you make fewer mistakes, and you have more energy. Now, again, I could sit here all day long trying to convince you that this is true. But what I would rather do is bring you through an exercise where you can experience this for yourself. Now, remember, if you can't play along with me, if you're driving or out walking, then know that I have resources for you at the end so you can try this out. But this is called um, Appajapa, I've heard it called Appajapa. It's basically a breath awareness exercise. It's going to take just a couple of minutes. So get yourself comfortable. Legs are in cross. Maybe this time you have your hands in your lap, one on top of the other, and just feel yourself melt into whatever surface that you're resting on. Check your teeth, and if they're touching, just relax your jaw. And for the next minute or so, all you are going to do is observe your breath. Not changing anything. Although it's interesting, sometimes when we observe it, it changes. But just getting curious. Are your inhales long or short? What parts of your body move when you breathe? You maybe pay attention to some of the qualities of your breath. Is it warm or cool? Take 
smoother rough. Just observing, not trying to change anything. Do you notice parts of your body where the breath seems to touch and parts where it doesn't? No judgment, just being curious. And now with this calm and clear mind, I invite you to have an insight as to how you may change your schedule so you'd have more time for your studies. Maybe you think of something you can do differently, something you can delegate, something you can completely let go of, Let's take one more nice deep breath in. Maybe H-A it out. <sighs> Tap your toes to come back into your body. When you're ready, blinking your eyes open. I usually like a nice big stretch after that one. But if you're willing to share any insights that you had or maybe how you felt after doing that, and I have had a lot of people say, the first time I did that, nothing came for me. But something occurred to me first thing in the morning when I woke up. So sometimes you just need a good night's sleep. So be aware tomorrow when you wake up, if you have an insight about something that could change to help you be more productive. So given what we just learned and what you just experienced, I'd like to encourage you to adopt a new definition of self-care. And from this point forward, I would love for you to think of self-care as any activity that provides evidence that you believe you are worthy. So maybe you've heard you can't pour from an empty cup. And I have never met anyone who disagrees with that saying. They say, yes, I know. If I don't take care of my body, if I don't take care of my mind, I'm not a good fill-in-the-blank partner, employee, nurse, teacher, doctoral student. And yet we don't do it often. Many people don't. And even those who do often don't do it regularly. Now, here's where we could segue and get off on a whole other topic called the imposter syndrome. And if you haven't heard of this concept, imposter syndrome is well studied in the academy, especially in higher degree programs, but really it's prevalent everywhere. If you've ever had feelings like you doubt your ability or you feel like a fraud, you've experienced imposter syndrome. Remember that statistic. 50% of people are dropping out most towards the end when you're in a highly stressful process that causes you to often doubt your abilities. So your self-care practice is the best way to combat this. It starts the wheels in motion and lays the groundwork for your best expression of you. It allows you to step into your genius self. But there's a catch that can be scary. And again, we don't have time to dig into this. I'll have a resource for you at the end if this is kind of um, striking a chord with you or maybe even hitting a nerve. But let's do something that's not so scary. Let's talk about thinking of something that we're going to start or maybe restart tomorrow. And I like to use the acronym C. S-E-A, it's my favorite place in the world to be. And the S stands for simple. So I want you to think about something that's really easy to do. And as your wheels start spinning and you're thinking of some things, I'm going to layer on that E. 
for enjoyable. What sounds fun to you? And I would argue this is the most important part of a self-care practice. So if as I was talking, you were thinking, all right, that's it. I'm going to go for a mile run tomorrow, or I'm going to swing by the gym on the way home, but you hate running and you loathe the gym, then please don't call it your self-care practice. Call that Christian body maintenance. And there's a time and a place for that too. But what I'm talking about here, the self-care practice we're talking about on this call is something that needs to be enjoyable. The A is agile. And that just means be okay with change, right? I mean, things happen. So I have time set aside in the morning for my self-care practice. And sometimes life throws me something, say a sick kid, where that can't happen. And my practice becomes humming on the way to the Keurig. And I'm okay with that. There's no judgment there. I'm okay with it changing from day to day. So I would love to hear some ideas that may have come for you while I was talking about those three traits. Something that you think you could do tomorrow. Maybe it's painting, being out in the garden, going for a walk with your dog, knitting. That's awesome. I love that. Sound meditation, another great one. And if nothing's coming to mind, Zumba, Sonia, I wish I could be there with you. That's one of my favorites. If nothing's coming to mind, you learned two exercises today, and maybe one of them was enjoyable to you, and you could try that. And by the way, if you have people in your home, kids especially, the humming can be really powerful. So where do we go from here? If you signed up for a doctoral program, you agreed, put me in the growth zone, right? So you're going to start somewhere. I'm going to suggest tomorrow, pick something you can do tomorrow. If, if you say, I'm, you know, I see Sheila's going to go to bar class. And if there isn't one tomorrow, awesome. Let that be your Friday thing. Pick, make sure it's something you can do tomorrow and do something daily. You will have a lot of people telling you as you work your way through the program, if you want to get done, you need to work on your studies every single day. However, I rarely come across a student who has the cognitive capacity to be reading articles in the, in the library, researching, writing seven days a week. So what I would encourage you to do is think of your self-care practice as working on your doctoral program. Right. So maybe tomorrow you do some breath work, you take the dog for a walk, and when you get in bed at night and lay your head on your pillow, you get to check that box and say, I worked on my doctoral project, my dissertation today. Even if your class is the classes away from it. And this is not cheating because I promise you, if you have a consistent self care practice, when it is time for you to sit down to spend four hours in the library or six hours writing on a Saturday, you're going to be able to do it much more efficiently. Finding a partner and holding each other accountable makes it a lot more fun. Maybe you see someone on the call that you're in a class with, or maybe as you're listening to this talk, you're thinking of family members or friends who would want to be a self-care uh, accountability partner with you. And maybe you can reach out to them right after this call. So I'd love to know in the chat box, if you're willing, if tomorrow you're going to find time to invest in you. So that question, will you commit, usually sounds different to everybody. To some people, it's perceived as, do I deserve to finish this degree and call myself doctor? To some people, it sounds like, Am I willing to invest in myself? But if you're willing to commit and you want to share that with the group and put a why or a yes in the chat box, uh, I would love to see that. Let's do a quick recap. Why is this concept so important? I argue it is the single most important thing you can do to unleash your genius. And you need to be on top of your game to create a dissertation or a doctoral project that meets your program standards with less stress and on time. All right. 
The biggest barrier is thinking that you don't have time, but we busted that myth today, right? You learned the three traits of a successful practice. Please, please, please remember to keep it simple, fun, and let it morph over time. Often what you'll see is if you don't have a regular one and you just start out with a few minutes a day, it will really change and that you're going to start to crave it and do it more and more. You learned my two favorite self-care practice exercises, the humming breath and apajapa that only took a few minutes. And hopefully if you were able to play along, you experienced the benefits. So if you'd like more support or inspiration on this topic, I encourage you to check out my podcast, The Happy Doc Student. Episode number three, Unleash Your Genius, digs a little bit deeper into that slide where we kind of touched on this idea that hidden in the idea that you don't have time are maybe some feelings related to self-worth. Episodes 50 and 54 were, are very, very short. They're just like the practices I walked you through today. So if you weren't able to do it with us tonight, um, or you want to walk through it with me tomorrow, you can find those. Uh, they're on all podcast apps, Spotify, things like that. The Happy Doc Student, you should be able to find it. Before we get to question and answers, I want to do a quick little plug for next month's webinar, February 16th. Mark Woods, the author of Attack Your Day Before It Attacks You, is going to help you discover a new time paradigm and explain to you why you've been thinking about time all wrong. If you don't already follow Ask Finn and United States University on social media, I encourage you to do that. We are on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter, and that is the best way to find out about events just like this. At the end of each webinar, we always save time for questions and comments, but we don't record these so that people feel more comfortable coming forward with any concerns or challenges that they're facing. And so at the end of the webinar, I'll shoot a quick video to sum up what it was that we talked about for those of you who couldn't be there. Someone asked, can being busy make you more productive? And we had an interesting discussion about this. The bottom line is that it depends. And rather than focus on trying to make yourself less busy. When you think about a self-care practice, think about it setting the stage for you to be more effective or more productive. Again, a self-care practice is going to give you access, open you up. I almost think of it as a portal to the part of the brain that you need to make good decisions and think clearly. The second was that someone shared they were recovering from COVID and really struggling with keeping up with their coursework and they wanted some advice. So we talked about the importance of communication. Whenever you're struggling in your classes, please communicate. Let your faculty know, let your advisor know, let them problem solve with you. Don't just disappear. We talked about how sometimes a lot of people who are drawn to doctoral programs are perfectionists by nature. And that there's this balance of really focusing on the skills that that class is there to teach you versus a grade. So letting go of this idea that you're here to get a grade, and we even talked about how usually you're focused on grades to get you to the next level, but here you are basically at the top level, right? I can almost guarantee you no one's going to ever ask you your GPA ever again. So really looking at the course and what that course is meant to teach you and understanding if you can let a little bit of your perfectionism go, um, but not at the expense of learning that, of learning the skill that you need to learn in that class. Here's an example. I once worked with a student who was really struggling with some personal issues, but was in a statistics course and was trying to figure out, should he just push through and barely pass the class so that he didn't have to withdraw and retake it. And he was in a quantitatively focused program. And we had a discussion where, listen, you can push through this and pass the class, but you're basically shooting yourself in the foot because when you get to your dissertation, you're going to have to go back and relearn these things. So have those conversations with the people who can really guide you through it and always have compassion for yourself. One of the tips I gave was that whenever I'm trying to make a big decision, I sit down at my kitchen table and I pretend like my best friend 
is sitting across from me in the same exact situation I'm in, and I see what kind of advice that I give her. Someone shared that they take breaks between classes, and that really helps them. And we started off the discussion by talking about a break can mean different things to different people. It may mean just a week. It may mean a month. And that you should really be judicious with your breaks. Know yourself. Know why you're taking one. And if you're taking one so that you can refresh and restore and recover and come back ready to tackle the job at hand, then sometimes a break can really serve you. I usually recommend, depending on where you are in your program, talking to an advisor or your faculty about this, your reasons for wanting to do this and understanding the policy around breaks at the institution that you're at. In the end, this is your journey. And if you know a break is what you need, then you should consider taking one. Finally, we had someone share that their support network was really what kept them going. We do know that having a strong support network is related to degree completion, and we will have a webinar on how to compile and maintain a tribe. Um, but one of the things that I suggested was to identify a keeper of your why. And what do I mean by that? Come up with one sentence for why you're in this program, and then ask someone if they would do the honor of reminding you of that why when you need to be reminded of it. So this person shared that when she feels like she wants to quit, she tells her husband and he uh, so wisely recommends, honey, sleep on that and let's see how you feel in the morning. And inevitably, she feels like continuing. And so that sleep gave her that space that we talked about in the presentation today, right? Do not forget that when you're under stress, it's difficult it's not impossible for you to access the part of your brain you need to think clearly and make good decisions. So um, we'll, we'll have a topic on your support network coming soon, and I look forward to seeing you at the next webinar.